please welcome senior engineer at Netflix, Spring Cloud contributor and legend, Taylor Wixell. Thanks, man. All right, so I'm here to talk a little bit about how Netflix is adopting Spring. Uh, to start off, I'm Taylor Wixell, uh, senior software engineer. I've been at Netflix for about seven years. Uh, right now, I'm on the Java platform team. And just a little personal note, this is my 10th year attending Spring One. Um, actually, yeah, thanks. This is me getting Jurgen's autograph almost a decade ago. It's crazy how much better he's aged than I have. But if you haven't guessed, I'm a huge fan of Spring. Uh, a little bit about my team. So Java Platform team, we're a very small group of engineers, less than a dozen. Uh, but we own the Java developer experience for Netflix engineers. That means we just try to make it as easy as possible for them to build their applications while making sure those apps are ready for production, having everything they need to run in the cloud. And given we're such a small team, I mean, our mission is all about leverage. We need to do what we can with our limited resources. Our product, I mean, we build application generators to help engineers get started as quickly as possible. We also provide all the documentation and live support via Slack to help folks when they run into trouble. And we provide a slew of libraries from service discovery, configuration, service, service communication, metrics, tracing, security, everything you need to run in the cloud. Now, originally, those libraries and frameworks were built in-house. But I'm very proud to say, as of early 2019, we've moved our platform almost entirely over to Spring Boot. So why Spring? I mean, how did we get here? <laughs> Thanks. So when Netflix first started moving its infrastructure into the, crowd, into the cloud, we hit a lot of problems that seemingly hadn't been solved yet. Uh, we had to build a, a number of libraries to help us along our way. Some you may be familiar with, Eureka, Ribbon, Arceus, Hystrix. Um, and we stitched those together into a fleet of microservices using a custom dependency injection framework. Uh, this is all done with the single intent of building the service we all know. And we're trying to make sure that all of our customers can watch our content anywhere they want, anytime they want. Now, that tech stack served us really well for a long time. But like all tech stacks do, it did start to show its age eventually. Uh, we started to realize things were maybe a little more tightly coupled than we would like. Things were a little harder to test than we would like. Uh, every time there was a new JDK um, adoption, we'd have to spend a lot of time fixing bugs and making sure everything would work. And ultimately, the thing that really pushed us was the business changed. So this is the Netflix Hollywood HQ. Um, in 2018, Netflix spent almost $8 billion on content and produced something like 1,500 hours of Netflix originals in a single year. Um, as more streaming competition started to arise, we invested heavily in this content. So the business suddenly wasn't just about streaming our shows to customers. We also had to produce them. We needed to build apps and tools to make the studio more successful. It's things, Simple things like an app to accept pitches for new shows from anyone, anywhere in the world, to more complicated ideas like scheduling. Who should be on set at a given time, at a given place, recalculating those schedules and their inevitable filming delays, all the way out to ideas like capturing the footage right off a camera, streaming it directly to the cloud. That way a director can walk off set, go to their trailer, open up a version of the Netflix app, and see the scene they had just shot exactly as the viewers might see it. So this opened up a whole host of new problems for our developers. I mean, suddenly, they needed to prototype much faster. We had to learn how to be effective in the studio. This is a new space for us. And for those apps to even be useful, they needed to be deployed to the open internet so that our vendors and contractors could actually get access to them. We had to target a variety of platforms, not just browsers and phones, but embedded devices like smart cameras and animation workstations. And to get the job done, developers do what they do. They choose any technology under the sun. Whatever works, whatever fits their use case, or sometimes just what they're familiar with makes it easy for them to get started fast. This is just a, a small example of what folks were picking up. But as a small team like ours, we saw these new requirements coming at us, and it was kind of scary. I mean, how are we going to support every tech uh, choice that somebody might want to use? 
how do we make sure that that technology has integration with our metrics and security, distributed tracing? And that's really where the decision to move to Spring came from. I mean, you're here at this conference, you know Spring's got a lot of benefits to developers. Um, it's a huge ecosystem for our engineers to leverage. I mean, look at all the topics at this conference today. It seems like for any given technology, there's a Spring Boot starter out there for it. Of course, those starters come with great documentation. And not just docs, but example code bases, blog posts, YouTube videos, everything you need to get started learning a new piece of tech. And thanks to auto configurations and starters, most of the features just work out of the box. I mean, developers don't need to spend time researching how to get something up and running. And of course, when they do hit issues, because it's not an internal platform, our developers can just go out to Google and Stack Overflow and research and expect, and expect to be able to find help and useful information. Of course, there's a lot of benefits to the platform team as well. Um, Spring Boot starters are so easily composable, we're able to bundle up exactly the amount of functionality our users might need, leveraging conditional auto configurations, so that they get what they want, but nothing more than what they want. Uh, Spring comes with a lot of the production-ready features we care about, things like Spring Security, Spring Cloud, Micrometer for metrics. This just means there's a lot less we have to build in-house, so we're really happy to throw away a lot of our old code when we switch to these systems. And Spring gives us all the unifying abstractions we need. So no matter what part of the business we're working in and what technology choices they've chosen, we know that there's a consistent set of interfaces and coding patterns that we'll be working with. And it really helps us out with support. And of course, the fact that it's on a platform that's verified and working for Java 11, 13 even, I mean, that's a huge deal for us. That's so much less work we have to worry about when dealing with the new JDK release cadence. So yeah, it's a big party. We're all on spring, right? Everything's great. Well, there's still one big thing I haven't talked about yet, and that is the actual migration to the platform. I mean, given that we are the, the company of microservices, we've got quite a way to go. So to give you an update on where we are today, um, as of now, about 22% of our Java applications in production are running on the new Spring Boot platform. You can see from our timeline, uh, we've got, in less than a year, more than 300 apps, actually more than 350 as of this morning, running in prod. And this is a signal to us from our customers that they actually get value out of this application stack. I mean, Netflix is a culture of freedom and responsibility. There is no mandate forcing these folks to move their apps and rewrite them onto this. So to see this many applications running in production is a clear signal to us that we've done something right. And these are apps not just in the studio space, but in streaming, media encoding, finance, and as you'll see later, big data. So what did we learn throughout the process? Uh, the first one is, as tempting as it might be to build your own libraries and abstractions, we found it was a lot more effective for us to just stick with what Spring had and contribute any changes we needed back into the community. I mean, this really allowed customers to go out and find their own solutions. We still think about how to build the perfect set of tools for our engineers, but we spend even more time thinking about how to integrate the tools they find out in the wild into their current developer experience. Of course, we don't always get it right, so we also learned every auto configuration we've in needs to come with a bunch of toggles and feature flags. So if we do get in the developer's way somehow, they're able to just flip a switch and get back to work. And we also learned with any kind of technology change this big, partnership is one of the key factors to being successful, not just inside of the company, but outside as well. Netflix and Pivotal have had a great relationship for a number of years now. Uh, they've packaged up some of our original libraries into projects like Spring Cloud Netflix in a way that's just amazing to use. In fact, so good that Netflix consumes our, their own libraries using Spring Cloud Netflix. So we really just wanted to take a moment and thank those Pivotal engineers for all the work they've done. They've helped us out a lot. They've been <laughs> They've been crazy open to collaborating with us, giving us technical guidance, critical feedback, and that's the sort of thing we needed to build confidence in making such a massive bet as this to move our entire stack over to Spring. Now, to give folks an idea of what our engineers are actually building on this stack, I'd like to hand it over to an amazing Netflix engineer, Tom Gianos. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So I want to talk a little bit about how we, on the Big Data Platform, are using Spring Boot in production to help 
people within Netflix uh, do data analytics at scale. So what does the big data platform exist to, to solve? What are we there? What's our, what are they paying us to do? Well, as you can predict, Netflix has a lot of data. And people throughout the company want to answer various questions. There's engineers, there's management, there's data scientists, there's the people in LA that Taylor was talking about earlier. And they're all trying to answer various questions based on the data that we have. But they don't want to know where that data is stored, how to access that data, what binaries are needed to access that data. And that's where we come in. Our job is to build a platform. So we have our data warehouse on S3, about 100 petabytes. It's actually closer to 200 petabytes at this point. And then on top of that data set, we actually have a team building a whole bunch of services. So we have our data warehouse services resolving metadata, data ingestion. We've got our compute cluster team that's managing deployment of Hadoop and Presto. We've got our orchestration services team, which I'm a member of, and we're responsible for how to run jobs and coordinate the jobs for all the users within the platform. And on top of all these services, we have our data API, which is a GraphQL tier. And then we ship a Python client, because data scientists love Python. And we have a web portal, where people can just go and type in their SQL queries and run. And cross-cutting the entire platform is an insight services team collecting more data about how people are using the platform, how the platform is performing, and we're feeding ourselves within our ecosystem. All these services that you see here, these teams are building on Spring Boot. And it's a wide variety of use cases. But I want to drill down into a more concrete case. So I'm going to talk about one service in particular that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been working on this project for a few years now. And it's Genie. It's our big data orchestration service. So it's a distributed job orchestration service. It serves about 250,000 jobs a day in production, another about 100,000 in prod, or in test, rather. And these jobs span a variety of dimensions. So there, there's long running, there's short running, there's ad hoc, there's people wanting to run Spark, people wanting to run Presto. So we, have to, we can't write a program that just solves one use case. We have to do something that's very generic, very pluggable. There's two major components to Gene. There's the web server, which is pretty traditional. It has a REST API. It runs a gRPC server to communicate with our other major component. The web server also does notifications and those kind of things. The agent itself is another Spring Boot application. It's actually a CLI, so it's a little unique in the sense that most Spring Boot applications are on the web tier. But we use Spring Boot in the agent, and we do a lot of lazy loading of beans to speed up the startup. And it communicates back to the server over gRPC. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about Genie at this conference in particular is that the majority of our code is actually in open source. Uh, probably about 98% of the business logic lives in open source that anybody can go look at see how we're using it. And then we rewrap that internally with the Java runtime team from Taylor, all their starters to get nice bindings. So how does Genie work? Well, it's pretty simple. The compute admins, when they bring up resources, register them with Genie. All the metadata is available about what binaries are needed to run on certain clusters. Then we have our aforementioned users, whether it's programs or analysts or whatever it is. And they're going to submit their job requests containing metadata, uh, whatever they want to do, where they want their data stored, what data set they want. Genie's then going to put on his thinking cap and say, OK, well, I know what I have available in my metadata stores, and I know what you asked for, so I'll, I'll, let me choose the best place to run your job, whether it's the SLA cluster or another place. It then submits and monitors the job. And this is where the agent comes in and actually is one-to-one -one with the job, so it'll monitor it all the way to completion. So this seems pretty simple, right? I mean. There's not much more to talk about here. It's a pretty simple app from this level. Well, like, like you can guess, it's really not that simple in production. So this is closer to what a real production deployment looks like. Not quite as boxy. I purposely made it boxy, but not totally boxy. So um, you can see here that there's a lot of systems that we actually integrate with, things that are happening as side effects of any given job run. We're publishing notifications. We're storing logs in S3. We're communicating with RDS for, for data storage. We're communicating with other Netflix services. We're crossing boundaries of environments. There's a lot going on here. And if we had to manually manage this interaction, we'd probably end up here at the bar every night if we had to write all this code from scratch. So how do we solve this problem? Well, spring to the rescue, right? So we use a lot of spring in Genie. I'm not going to list all of the things or read through this entire slide, but suffice it to say that there's a lot of Spring going on in here to help us interact with all these different services, 
get things working in a robust and reliable manner and collect metrics and all those things. I want to talk quickly about how Spring helps us deploy the OSS internally, which is really one of the great benefits. Back in when Taylor talked about our other older stack, we used to have to run, we were on Spring before the Java platform team went to Spring, and so we used to have to kind of run a, a one JVM with two servers running inside of it, the old stack and the OSS code. Well, now we can run our OSS code directly. And what we found is that auto configurations have been invaluable. We can define all of our beans in default beans in OSS with all the conditionals on them and have them overridden internally by the Java runtime team as necessary. And in particular, security has been great for this because we used to have to hand roll our own security. And now Taylor's team takes care of all of that stuff for us, so we don't have to do it. And additionally, property bindings are great because we can, def we can ship with a set of default properties. And depending on what environment we deploy to, we actually get different behaviors all with, out of the box with Spring Boot. So that's all the time I have. I just want to thank everybody for, for listening to us. But uh, if you have any questions, Taylor and I will be around the talk for the rest of the day. And have a good day.